Hi, I'm uh, Grandin Gill, and I'm here to talk a little bit about what informing science is uh, and where we're going. Uh, a lot of times in this conference, one of the things we discover is that people are so attracted by the tremendous friendliness and helpfulness of the hosts that we don't even realize what is the unifying theme of this conference, informing science. And so that is my job today, is to try to give you a little bit of a feeling of it. And uh, the key themes I'm going to be talking about today are what is informing science, some of the areas of investigation that we have pursued in our research agenda over the, about the past 10 years since the field emerged, and then finally, I'm going to give you kind of a wish list for things that I would like to see in the future. Uh, right now, I am the editor-in-chief of uh, Informing Science, uh, the International uh, Journal of an Emerging Transdiscipline. So my hope is that this will stimulate contributions on your part should you find some of these topics to be of interest. So let's begin by what Informing Science is. And to start out, let's think about an ideal world. Now, in an ideal world, we have a whole bunch of fields, each of which is doing their own research, but all of which overlap, and when they overlap, they collaborate with each other. The inspiration for informing science, which was uh, Eli Cohen's uh, work uh, and his uh, seminal Ugly Duckling paper, basically pointed out that within a university there are lots and lots of different disciplines that talk about informing, but the problem is they don't know what each other is talking about because in an ideal world we see overlapping disciplines like computer science, information science, education, communications, instructional technology, philosophy, MIS, and so forth. In the world where we actually live, the relationship is more like a series of separate fortresses, each of which occasionally will lob rocks at each other because they don't like the way we conduct our research or what we consider research, uh, or we're trying to protect our own borders because heaven help us if somebody teaches the type of subjects that we teach or if somebody researches in the areas that are our favorite research areas. So, if you take a look at informing science, it was originally specified as, uh, in Eli Cohen's paper, as a transdiscipline that studies systems that provide their clientele with information in a form, format, and schedule that maximizes its effectiveness. And so, it had a very, very strong technology flavor, which was very, very much appropriate at the time because, um, you know, as we look at it, uh, a whole bunch of technologies were transforming the world. Over the past 10 years, though, we have evolved a little bit beyond that. In particular, the notion of a clientele and the notion that we've got a separate informer and a separate client turns out to be very, very limiting. Because in many, many systems, it's very, very hard to figure out who the client is, who the informer is, uh, and so forth. Research collaborations, who's, who's the client and who's the informer. Even in a relationship, say, between a patient and a doctor, uh, you might say the doctor is the informer, but in fact, it is the patient who is providing most of the information to the doctor in order for the doctor to make a diagnosis. Similarly, form format schedule suggests a very structured type of process. And there are some informing processes that are very structured. Uh, and when we get a very, very structured process, we can often build an information system to make that structure even uh, stronger and more tightly uh, formed. However, a great deal of informing in this world takes place through informal and ad hoc types of processes, and if we ignore that when we talk about informing, we are ignoring some of the most important ways that informing is taking place. Uh, 
And as I will emphasize throughout this presentation, one of the key things informing science needs to do is it needs to take a very broad perspective because that is where we add value. Similarly, maximizing effectiveness suggests somehow that we're trying to optimize the exchange of information uh, and that informing revolves around a task. The fact of the matter is a lot of informing does not revolve around a task. You know, when we socialize in this conference, we are informing each other, but we're not necessarily doing it with a distinct purpose in mind. Uh, a lot of it is a process that is much, much more emergent. So these are some of the things that we've started to look at in informing science as we broaden our view of what informing is. A more general definition, uh, and, and this is, I would not say this is the final word, this is what, what, what happened when I started typing up this slide, is you might say that informing science is a transdisciplinary study of systems that employ information to impact clientele. And uh, impact can include what we traditionally call informing, but I use the term impact to avoid using informing in my definition of informing. Uh, so uh, now what are some of the key distinctions here? Well, we're transdisciplinary, which means that whenever we talk about informing science, we are dealing with uh, the process of informing. That's sort of the unifying theme. Now, it may be informing through an information system. It may be informing through social media. It may be informing through face-to-face -face informal conversations. But nonetheless, let's assume that, that informing is an important part of what we're trying to do in informing science. So that limits us from, you know, from slightly. The transdisciplinary aspect of it means that we accept multiple perspectives. And frankly, for academics, multiple perspectives is one of the most difficult things for us to accomplish. Because in each of our disciplines, we have been trained, and some might say indoctrinated or conditioned, to view research in a particular way. You talk to doctoral students uh, who have been trained in the United States with a positivist empirical type of training and they simply do not consider anything of research to which you can't attach a statistical significance. On the other hand, when you talk to philosophers, they've got a totally different perspective on this. When you talk to people who have been educated in the European system, they take a very, very different type of view of what constitutes research. Well, one of the things about informing science as a transdiscipline is we need to try to develop an appreciation for research in all its forms, not just limited to the form in which our particular discipline has come to view uh, research. Because as soon as you start limiting yourself, you start to create those silos. We serve client disciplines. The idea is that we offer a sort of a unifying perspective that allows different disciplines to think about informing in ways that they might not have thought of it uh, on their own. Now, there are lots of examples of transdisciplines, things like uh, statistics is a transdiscipline. Statistic, statistics in and of itself uh, isn't necessarily all that interesting. It becomes more interesting when you apply it to particular problems and you see people in all different disciplines applying statistics. Complexity science is an emerging uh, area that's transdisciplinary. Design science is another area. So informing science is basically a focus on a specific problem or challenge or setting, the challenge of informing. Now, I talk about systems because uh, the building block of informing science is what we call the informing system. And an informing system tracks flows of information and it tracks flows of resources. Uh, in other words, a lot of informing <laughs> takes considerable amount of resources, as we've seen in this, con uh, in, in this conference. You know, we want people to join our informing community, but at the same time, we'd like to get a membership fee, uh, and that type of flow is critical uh, for an informing system to survive. Now, the boundaries of an informing system are often quite different from other boundaries. Uh, 
Every one of us comes from one country or another, but international boundaries in this conference matter much, much less than they would in other contexts. Disciplinary boundaries matter much, much less. So we're trying to create an informing system with very different boundaries from the formal uh, boundaries that may exist in your academic institution, uh, your country, and so forth. Information. Uh, here we're basically talking about uh, non-random patterns carried through some medium, and that's about as general as I can make it. Uh, and uh, what we're particularly interested, because we're interested in informing, is we want to be able to produce a change in client state. Uh, many of you, I am sure, as I have, have lectured to a group of students, and by the end of the 75 minutes, uh, it is not the least bit clear that any state change has occurred in the minds of any of the people out there. Uh, um, you perhaps, as the instructor, have been informed that many people have learned to sleep with their eyes open, but, <laughs> but that, is not, that is not informing. That, and so we're interested in a change in state. And this state can be symbolic, and a lot of people view uh, research purely in symbolic terms, or it may be non-symbolic. We may be, our goal may to be to produce a particular emotional state. And we need to consider all of these things uh, when we start viewing um, information and informing processes. Clientele is one of my favorite areas <laughs> because it seems so simple. Okay, I am going to inform someone. Except most informing doesn't take place that way. In fact, you've got information going back and forth. Uh, a very, very reciprocal, iterative type of process. Uh, you may have uh, many clients informing each other, and it's not clear who the informer role is. Uh, a brainstorming session is an example, where people are just tossing out ideas. Uh, whether or not... Uh, a client is necessarily a person is still a debate in our field. You will find that some people, uh, Zbigniew Gakowski being an example, absolutely rejects the notion that a human has to be involved in an informing system. Uh, he believes that you know if you have a machine that tells another machine something to do, an informing process goes along. There are other people in our field who strongly believe that a human being must be involved in the process. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, but the point is that we have to be open to these multiple uh, perspectives if we're going to fully uh, capture uh, the richness of informing processes. So with that brief introduction, what I want to do is talk a little bit of some of the areas that we have pursued in informing science research over the last 10 years and how the field is changing to some extent. And after I've done that quick review, uh, what I'll then do is talk about my own wish list of what I'd like to see uh, done over the next few decades. So um, the first area involves the evolution and creation of informing systems. Now, if you take a look at uh, uh, Eli Cohen's original article in 